Well, joining us now is the man who was Middle East Minister at the time, Nazanin was arrested, and that's the Conservative MP, Tobias Elwood. Hello to you, Mr Elwood. Thank you for joining us on the programme this morning. How optimistic are you that we're nearing the end game? You know, I, I really hope this is going to work out. Giving uh, Nazanin's passport back is significant. It's the best news that's come out of Tehran uh, in six years from her arrest. Don't forget, the Iranians don't actually recognise dual nationality. So the fact that she's received her passport is fantastic news. But as you've been reporting, We've had so many false dawns in the past, and not just this event, but Nazanin's arrest has been caught up in a wider geopolitical storm uh, in, in Iran. But fantastic effort by the Prime Minister, by the Foreign Secretary, in getting us where we are today. Yeah. Um, tell us a bit more about this debt that we owe um, to Iran and um, how the British government, I'm guessing, haven't paid it until now because they don't want to see it as a ransom. Yeah, this was awkward for the British government. Prior to the uh, when the Shah was deposed back in uh, 1979, we actually had a deal with the uh, with Iran to sell um, 100 chieftain tanks there. We actually took the money, the 400 million pounds, but we never delivered the actual hardware itself. Ironically, the same tanks then went on to be sold uh, to the Iraqis, and then we were at war with uh, Iran. That debt has been left outstanding, and you mentioned. Uh, uh, I was responsible for the Middle East as minister. When I visited Tehran, met the family, Nazadine's family, uh, it was raised by the Tehran officials in the same meeting as we were discussing uh, the fortunes of Nazadine herself. They've always made a link between uh, the two. And I heard your interview uh, with the foreign secretary today. We'll have to wait to see what's being done behind uh, the scenes. It is difficult because of legacy sanctions to be able to pay this money back. Ultimately, if you pay the money, slide it across the table, it's actually seen as an arms deal. Um, so, of course, uh, from that perspective, it can't be, uh, it, it wouldn't be allowed to go through. So there needs to be a cleverer way, perhaps through an intermediary, Oman, for example, for that debt to be paid. Mm. Um, as you say, sanctions mean that they can't get the money um, at the moment, although there had been some suggestions by a previous foreign secretary. I think it was Jeremy Hunt that first uh, suggested the idea that aid and or medical supplies could be a way out. It's an awful lot of aid and medical supplies, 400 million plus um, interest. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And uh, I looked at different ways of going through a third party. Uh, I spent some time speaking with the Imanis as well. Uh, they have a, an important relationship with Tehran. They could have been, acted as that conduit as well. Things became further complicated because, of course, Hassan Rouhani, the moderate uh, president that we were working with, was, was replaced by a much, uh, you know, extreme hardliner, Ibrahim Rahisi. And, uh, but the uh, Iranian economy is now in trouble and they need to secure a nuclear deal. Uh, otherwise, uh, Rahisi himself uh, will find things very, very difficult at home. I think this may have been part of clearing the air, recognizing that having the United Kingdom on side makes sense. So perhaps if that uh, tank deal has been sorted out, led to the passport being returned, but let's wait until she's on a plane out of here before we start to celebrate. Pleased to hear that you watch the programme so avidly. Uh, Mr Elwood, I don't know if you caught our interview with the Estonian ambassador to the UK. He says that his people are concerned about what's happening in Ukraine and what might happen to them. I'm guessing because they're under the cloak of NATO and also they have a significant number of NATO and British troops uh, in Estonia. Things will be fine there, but we can see how what's happened has unsettled the whole region. Oh, absolutely. And I think the penny is now dropping. I can see us eventually increasing, you know, Britain's uh, hard power. Our defence budget is likely to go up. We're going to regroup as a continent, far more aware of our security concerns, and uh, not least in Eastern Europe. We've entered a new era of instability and nations need to work together. This is not just about Ukraine and the Estonian uh, um, ambassador and indeed others are right to raise these concerns. We've done well on the sanctions. There's no, about, no doubt about it. Putin, I think, is, is now going to be eventually a spent force in Russia. They will eventually depose him himself. But that's going to be quite tricky. It takes a while for the Kremlin to recognize that there's no future on the international stage for a country like Russia with Putin in charge. But whilst he remains in power, he's going to annihilate Ukraine. He cannot afford to lose there. And the big question for the West is how many war crimes must be committed? What extents of genocide must we uh, watch from afar before we choose uh, to step in? So I think it's important to recognise that there's much more that we can do beyond sanctions. We're still rather risk-averse in our decision-making. Putin will not stop. 
until he is stopped. Um, and just a thought before I let you go on what we've been hearing from President uh, Zelensky, um, saying he's, he's perhaps a little bit more hopeful as far as peace talks are concerned. Um, the Foreign Secretary saying she isn't. What's your view? Well, uh, you know, a huge tribute to Zelensky and what he's doing as a wartime leader. One of the difficulties that the Russians are facing is the, the sense of resilience that the, uh, that the Ukrainian people are actually showing. My concern, the way I read any talks that are taking place right now, is simply an excuse for Russia uh, to secure more time to rearm and regroup and then prepare for further attacks. That's what we've seen in the last discussions that are actually taking place. I think it will happen again. I reiterate, we need to be more robust in the utility of our hard power. We need to be more self-confident in stepping forward without losing control of that critical escalatory ladder when dealing with a nuclear power. But right now, every major initiative of support, like MiGs from Poland, is immediately dismissed as having the potential to trigger World War III. And this, I'm afraid it exhibits weakness and is being exploited by Putin, who then continues to test us. We really do need to rekindle our Cold War statecraft skills. OK, Mr Elwood, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to join us this morning. Thank you.